Hey everyone, I'm your host, Robbie Straczynski, and thanks so much for joining us on episode number 51 of Cards Chat, the friendliest poker podcast in town. Today's guest is a legend for his work in developing and growing tournament poker over his 25 plus years in the industry. Since 2010, he's been the executive tour director of the World Poker Tour. He's also a co-founder of the Tournament Directors Association, that's the TDA, which has standardized tournament rules, tournament poker rules throughout the world. He's presided over thousands of tournaments worldwide and is a lock for future induction into the Poker Hall of Fame. Matt Savage, welcome to the Cards Chat Podcast. Thank you, Robbie. Appreciate it. It's good to see you and speak with you again. Yes. How are you doing today? I'm doing good, doing good. It's uh, just got back from Mexico. So uh, that uh-huh. was a week of a vacation, but uh, didn't get much of a sunburn, you know? I got, got, gotcha. Well, I'm glad you had a I'm good time. I'm looking pretty pale still. I'm glad you had a good time. Um, <laughs> I got to say, we have a special treat, folks. Everyone who's watching, who's listening. This is not just uh, another guest, not just another famous poker personality. We have a true fan of the show on today because when I asked Matt, hey, will you join us? He literally named some of you guys who put forth the questions in our members section. Like by name, you remember, you know, Acid, Burn FX, Shells, Crystals, he knew everybody. So <laughs> Absolutely. We have, this, Absolutely. This is legitimate. So uh, I'm very excited and Matt knows what this show is all about. So uh, we're excited to, to bring him to you. Um, okay, so Matt, let's, let's start from the beginning. We know you, of course, is one of the faces of the World Poker Tour as its executive tour director, but just like professional players, they grind their way up the, the, the micro stakes all the way up to the high rollers. Uh, you, you weren't born the executive tour director of the WPT. You had uh, a background in uh, chip running, in dealing. So maybe you can give us um, a little bit of an inkling. What was your start like in poker in the early days? Yeah, this is actually my 30th year in the industry. So uh, I'm actually writing an article about it right now. Yeah, 30 years in the industry, started in 1991. Uh, Basically, like you said, I was running chips, which isn't even a profession anymore. Basically, (laughs) it was you used to carry around racks of chips to the table uh, while people were playing. And uh, I worked in a place that had low ball and uh, spread limit and and limit hold them, mostly limit hold them. Uh, No limit wasn't even really a thing uh, where I was at in San Jose. So that's kind of how I got my start. Uh, And then I went on to be a a poker dealer, which I loved. Uh, You'd probably still be doing it today if I didn't uh, develop carpal tunnel uh, Mm -hmm. syndrome. So I had to go on the floor uh, because I wasn't going to make it as a professional poker player. I could see that early on. I just didn't have the patience for it, but uh, loved being in the industry and loved being around all the poker players so uh i I wanted to stick with it and stick in it and that and out of that uh i became a tournament director i was filling in for the guy that took a vacation in san jose and uh once he came back i go i love doing this and so luckily another casino opened up uh, in northern california and they hired me as their tournament director that's basically how I know I ended up being what I am today with the uh with the career that I have and you know a lot of that was because of the tda that is super cool. And we'll definitely be talking about the TDA. Uh, you know, we got to, you know, we can't not talk about the WPT. You're talking almost 30 years in the industry, 10 of those years, 10 plus years uh, you've been with the WPT. Um, do you have sort of like a, a favorite venue where the WPT events take place or a favorite memory from your time on tour with them? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, obviously, I've been with them since season one. Uh, in season one, we had an event up at Lucky Chances in Colma, where I was. It was the smallest venue we've ever done a, a World Poker Tour on. Uh, it was Mike Sexton and Linda Johnson, and they were the ones pitching it with Steve Lipscomb. Uh, they come up there. I was in that initial pitch meeting when they said, uh, let's bring the World Poker Tour to television. And uh, yeah, it was uh, an exciting time for sure. Um, that final table in itself was an exciting one with Antonio mm-hmm. Esfandiari right. and Phil Helmuth and uh, Tom Garza, Paul Darden won it, and Chris Bigler. Uh, it was a great event right there. Uh, we had a lot of fun, but I still probably think my favorite venue uh, is Bay 101, which right. was my home casino for over 20 years. Uh, basically, I was with them for since 1996 mm-hmm. uh, through through the pandemic. Uh, unfortunately, not with them anymore, but uh, you know, still have a deep connection and roots in with uh, San Jose. And so the Shooting Star event, obviously with the bounties and and all those things, but the final table where Phil Helmuth basically cried on the floor uh, will always be a memorable one. 
for, for you or for him? <laughs> <laughs> for both of us, for, for both, both of us. Because I, I ended up getting on the microphone and calling him back in because he forgot to sign the shirt. Oh, gosh. Uh, the person that bust him. And then he came back in. And, you know, he was a, you know, Phil is who he is, but he's also a great personality and, and sure. somebody that's been great for the game. Sure. And a good sport, uh, generally speaking. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, he was uh, our guest, I believe, on episode four uh, here on the Cards Chat podcast. Yes. Um, are there, I mean, you mentioned the Bay of 101, and of course, WPT has had events all over the world. Is there a poker room or casino where someday you'd love to see the WPT, you know, put a footprint there? Look, we're, we're, you know, we really are proud of the fact that we're the World Poker Tour. So being around the world would be awesome. How about an event in Israel? <laughs> Let's do an event in Israel. How about that? I love that? it. <laughs> WPT Bethlehem. I like it. I will be the first person to sign up. Well, the Dead Sea's got some great resorts and we've got a lot. <laughs> so we have the infrastructure. We just need to have the will uh, and, and we'll get the poker tables. I will be the first person to sign up. You have my, you have my, <laughs> my commitment there. Awesome. Awesome. No, I, I, we've been all over the world, I, India and China and Latin America and uh, definitely had some amazing stops, you know, Canada. Uh, and, you know, we're looking to go all over the world. We, we you know, with the, the new ownership that's in place, it's going to be exciting. We're, you know, hopefully going to be bigger and better. And uh, I believe that that will happen. Well, that's really cool. It's funny, like you mentioned that it kind of sort of dovetails a little bit into my next question. You said you've been with the World Poker Tour since season one, I think you're season 19 now, right? Season 19, correct. Season 19. So obviously the company has gone through so many iterations, but it's still the World Poker Tour we all know and love. It has grown, obviously, you know, from just that first event of, oh my gosh, can we get this together? And we had a few casinos signing up. It really is, you know, living up to its name, the World Poker Tour all over the world. How has that sort of, you know, evolved as far as your role and your involvement with the company? You know, what has all of this growth and these transition meant as far as what, what you do with uh, the World Poker Tour? It's been amazing. I've I've had so many different jobs with World Poker Tour, from being in a relationship uh, with our casino partners, uh, the relationship with the players. Uh, I do the bust out interviews for the you know, the sideline reporter, uh, which is I say the worst job in poker. And Maria and Kara Scott will agree with me. It's <laughs> awful when you, somebody busts out of a tournament, you stick a mic in their face and say, "How does that feel?" You know, basically they don't really love it. Uh, <laughs> understandably yeah uh, so it makes it very tough and uh, maria and kara scott and others that do that make it look very easy i gotta be honest it's uh, mm -hmm. it's not a very easy job but i do that as well um and just my role i mean now i'm doing live streaming i'm doing some commentary on the online stuff that we're doing we have some online events coming up in the united states and uh with party poker and i'll be on some of those live streams and the commentary and i just have really grown into a lot of different roles with them and i really enjoy it i mean running tournaments is basically my passion uh, and uh, something that I love to do and will always love to do and uh, be involved with the players and making rulings and doing all those things. But all of these other roles have been very, very exciting as well. So uh, it's been a nice uh, change of pace, uh, especially when we've been home, that they've been keeping me busy and, and still in the industry and uh, keeping up with things as they go along. Well, that's really cool. Obviously, uh, adaptation is the name of the game, both at and away from the felt. And <laughs> you've done so. And of course, the World Poker Tour has done so. Uh, you gave those shout outs. We've got to do the same to Maria Ho, to Kara Scott episodes. Uh, Kara was 21. Maria was 22 on the Cards Chat podcast. Right. That's what we got to do. We got to build it up and have all the people you're going to name drop. We're going to have them on first. So Awesome. Guys, be sure to, to go back and listen to those episodes after this. See one. if I can uh, name drop all 50 of them. Oh, goodness. I got my list here <laughs> to make sure <laughs> you're going to put me to the test here. Um, before the WPT, you know, before season one, you were the tournament director for the World Series of Poker during those early years of the poker boom, 2002 to 2004. I mean, those were the years of essentially the exponential growth, you know, and then the moneymaker year was, well, the, the Varconi year was around 500 participants and, you know, 2004 with Greg Raymer, 2,500 participants. What was it like, you know, again, you're playing a central role with the World Series of Poker, being the tournament director. I mean, first of all, were you prepared, uh, you and your colleagues, you have to run a tournament, were you prepared for, oh my God, like we have 2,500 people here? <laughs> Like, yeah. what, what was that like? The, yeah, the first year with the Varconi, six, uh, 696, oh, right? Wow. And so we, uh, yeah, we 
we knew that it was the World Series was going through some trans transition. The year before, there were some issues with the uh, floor staff and getting paid and things like that. Uh, and you know, a lot of people said to me, "You probably shouldn't even take this job." But I I felt like it was an opportunity uh, of a lifetime, whether I even got paid or not. It was going to wow. be something that I would, you know, be able to stick on my career and my resume and, and it would be really good. And so I had that conversation with uh, both of our friends, Linda Johnson. I know she's been on the show too. Yep. Yep. Uh, <laughs> episode 39. Yep. <laughs> episode 39. And she told me not to take it. So really? my good wow. friend, Linda said, don't do it because, you know, you're not going to get paid. And I said, Linda, it doesn't matter. I don't care if I get paid or not. Let's, hmm. uh, I'm going to go in there and, and make it uh, the best I can. And uh, it was a very successful event. Rob Barconi won that event. Uh, Phil Helmuth kind of stole the, the spotlight of it uh, when he got his head shaved yeah, afterwards. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, you know, he was a good sport there too. And so um, when we came in the next year, we had some involvement with the internet companies and poker stars and online. And uh, you know what happened. Chris Moneymaker yeah. won. It kind of really took off. It was a perfect storm of televised poker with World Poker Tour and the World Series of Poker and uh, a new crew 441 productions from uh they came in and and covered the event and did a great job norm chad and uh lon mccarran uh both on your shows as well yep yep <laughs> i think 26 it. and 42 but i think i'm gonna you do it I'm gonna, I'm gonna i'm gonna name drop all of them so it, <laughs> so yes we had those events and uh you know it was when phil ivy who you haven't had on your show yet yes up, yes at <laughs> a big year uh but yes it was um it was really an awesome experience, you know, being there and seeing him and Sam Farrell go heads up and uh, a great final table that we had there uh, that year. And then kind of knew out of that, it was really going to explode. So it was the first year at the World mm -hmm. Series of Poker where we had a different starting days. I put in a day 1A and a 1B. Uh -huh. the following year. Luckily, we did that because, uh, you know, we got that 2,539 amount of entries. Right. The following year. So, yeah, it was uh, that year with, with Moneymaker, we had 81 tables. And we fit everybody in the tournament and wow. they were on some stud tables that were eight handed and people were jammed up and people were all the way from one end of the casino to the other. Sure. And uh, we almost got shut down by the fire marshal. We had a, <laughs> a, you know, people will go crazy about this. But we had 11 handed tables uh, to try and fit at everybody. the main event <laughs> at the main event. Yes, that's correct. Wow. Because we had to get everybody seated. People don't know, but there wasn't all this late registration that we had today back mm -hmm. in those days. So, you know, you kind of had to be registered before the tournament started uh, or else you don't get in the tournament, right? So hmm. we had some people actually get in because they were in line. But if you didn't sign up before the tournament started or you weren't in line before the tournament started, you were out. Wow. And so it was, um, that was amazing year 2003. Unbelievable. And, uh, 2004, I'm even yeah. more amazing with all those people. I'm wondering, you know, after having like, again, these days after having done it so many times and poker is, you know, fully developed as an industry, those were in a, in a sense, again, poker was around, but those were very, very exceptional types of years. You finish those events and you go back to your regular job of running tournaments elsewhere, that sort of thing. What sort of lessons do you take away from experiencing a main event and having to sort of, you know, figure things out on the fly. Oh, we'll do a day one, day two. Like, what, what do you take away from, from those experiences? Um, you know, it was just a lot of work and preparation. You had to be forward thinking. And that's kind of mm -hmm. something that I've always tried to be in my career is forward thinking about the next steps and what we're going to do to make uh, things work. And uh, as we've seen a lot of the events we've had on the World Poker Tour this year, are broken records. So we didn't yeah. know how we we're going to handle all those things. And, you know, even down in Seminole Hard Rock, we had so many alternates and, and things. And, you know, it makes it tough for the players. Uh, but players have been very understanding uh, coming out of this. And I think that uh, we're really uh, doing a great job to try and make accommodate everybody and make it happen. But I think you could just really have to be uh, thinking in advance of what what's the worst that could happen. And even in 2004, we had some issues where we ran out of chips and people uh -huh. Don't, probably don't know that story either you know we yeah. ran out of chips in the in the main event and so after day 1a we had to uh, open up some chips and, and take chips out and put them back into another chip with a bigger denomination and, wow uh, yeah one of the one of the the people that came in there had 30,000 in chips so they had a bag full of chips they came back to three 10k chips and a few <laughs> and i think three 100 dollars chips and that was also helmet uh, that did that and, Nobody really complained. Nobody said anything wrong. They, everybody was so excited about the numbers and how big it, right, was. it right. was. Really, you know, it was really part of the experience back then. You know, being down uh, uh, downtown, Binion's Horseshoe, and all of that. Sure. It really, 
it was really a different time in the game, that's for sure. I imagine that the participants themselves, to a degree, you know, whether you're, if you're new, you don't know, okay, things ought to be better than this, so to speak, as far as chips. And if you're experienced, you probably just, like you said, like mesmerized, oh my God, like what's happening? All right, I'll deal with three 10K chips. It's not, yeah. <laughs> not that big of a yeah. deal. Yeah. My goodness, what a time. What a, what a yeah, it was time. definitely a, a great time, but I, I, I still have to say that I was the biggest winner coming out of the World Series in, in 2003 because I, that's where I met my wife, Marianne. Yeah, oh, she, shout out uh, to Marianne. Very yeah, cool. she was, uh, yeah, she was a cocktail waitress there at the Binion's Horseshoe. And, uh, you know, that's where we met. And that's how uh, we're still together 17 years later, which is like almost a record for the poker industry, to be honest. Beautiful. That's a beautiful story. I love how <laughs> poker brings people together. It's uh, yes, it that's does. a great thing. Uh, you yes, know what? We does. talk about like those old days and you, know, you say again, you know, but basically 30 years in the industry. That's a very cool thing. We don't often get on this show or on any shows these days, you know, people who've been around for so long. On the player side, we often talk about how strategy has changed and how people have gotten better and the, the learning curve is steeper and they, like, you know, the, the way you learn is so different. We talk about that kind of stuff. I'm wondering on the industry side, you know, you have been seeing poker through its very different phases of growth through the online stage through this pandemic year you know you've played also a very integral and pivotal role in poker's development what could you sort of say has changed like you said maybe things that we don't realize we just take for granted nowadays that didn't used to be like that over these last couple of decades well, limit limit holdem was bigger than no limit holdem, if you can believe that. That was uh, something. Even when I came into the came in in two thousand two, you know, more people were playing limit holdem than they were playing no limit. So, mm -hmm. uh, the game has obviously really transitioned, and uh, the fact that online um, people were getting sponsored by online and people were winning their way in through online really, you know, had a big uh, positive impact. Uh, I also think that the uh, the televised aspect of it really had a big uh, part of that. But now we have coaching and we have, uh, you know, charts and all kinds of things that weren't around back in the day. Um, and, you know, some people feel like it's uh, much better for the game. Some people feel like it's much worse. Uh, you know, I don't know. What's your opinion on that? Do you feel like it's, uh, you know? Me? Yeah. I don't think I've been around long enough to know what's better, or what's worse. But <laughs> generally speaking, you know, trying new things. I'm, I'm, I'm for, you know, going outside one's comfort zone just so you should know. Okay, I can handle this. You know, if if it comes my way, type of a thing. Trying and just experimenting. We'll talk about you know one of the a couple of things you've experimented with oh, yeah. tournament wise. Uh, you know, a little bit later on in the show, but you know, trying different things, especially like this last pandemic year. It's a great opportunity when things aren't normal. Let's give this a try. Give you know whatever and see if it works. If it doesn't, we'll go back to the way we had done it before. If so we'll change it or we'll add it into the schedule. Maybe there's room for, for both online and live, that sort of a thing. I don't know if that answers your question, but that's sort of my, my yeah. general approach. Yeah, What? well, let me ask you the question now, since I got you on the spot, online bracelets versus live bracelets. That's not think? a question. <laughs> no, what do you think? Are, I, they, as, think, are they as prestigious? That's well, the big I, question. As a... Well, my answer, honestly, I don't, it has to be taken into account that my answer comes as a recreational player rather than a professional player. Um, but I'm going to give you a media answer to that, okay. which would be, I think the best way. And I think what I hope what happens over time is that it just gets classified as such, meaning you've right. won, you know, two WPT titles, three circuit rings, one online bracelet and six live bracelets. Like there's nothing right. wrong with categorizing like that. And then the issue of prestige is up for the players to, to debate. Um, but, you know, go hard at it and, and certainly try your best and try to win. Everyone's happy when you get it. Uh, but I do think making the distinction is kind of important um, just for historical records purposes as a someone who, you know, tells the story of the poker world and, and passes it along. That's my opinion. I may sound a little diplomatic, but I do genuinely think that's the right approach towards it. Yeah, and I and we're listen. We're on the World Poker Tour. We're doing things with Party Poker, and we're doing things with Eight 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 and uh, different uh, online sites. I mean, that's part of our strategy. It's going to be there's going to be WPT online titles. So okay. the fact that they're on the WPT Mike Sexton 
Champions Cup uh, is up for debate as well. So okay, well so there we go. Know, it's one of those things. I do not blame the WPT. I don't blame the WSOP for running these things. You know, they're in a business, and uh, yeah. it makes sense. It makes perfect sense while we're going through this uh, terrible pandemic that you know we're going to do some things online. So uh, I don't blame them. There's some. Uh, you know, obviously some anger towards the the companies for doing this, uh, but I don't blame them one bit. It's smart business. So yeah. uh, let's, let's get that out of the way for sure. Cool. Well, you are uh, the rare, I don't know if in 51 guests, anyone has turned the tables and asked me any questions. So I appreciate that. And thank you. I got you. a couple more for you later on. Oh, goodness. <laughs> <laughs> So we'll get back to the ones we prepared for you, Matt. Um, okay. So you have worked on, I mean, correct me if, if my number is off, over 500 shows that you've been on? Uh, over 500 that? televised episodes, yeah. That right, been over on, so. 500 televised episodes during your time with the WPT and other Pokemon organizations as well. What are some of the crazier shows you've worked on? Or maybe you've got like a funny or interesting story from off camera that you're kind of sort of like chuckling to yourself off on the side or something. Maybe there's got to be some some funny stuff in there <laughs> that maybe you can well, share with we've us. Done, I've done like so many different things with Fox Sports Net. Back in the day, there was some a lot of different events and people don't even recognize realize that the guy that I worked with, his name was Gary Garcia, uh, was producer, did so many, uh, you know, uh, battle of the sexes and the, hmm. the the James gang versus Phil Locke's crew and stuff like that. And, and just a lot of different fun stuff and traveling and doing those things have been uh, exciting. We had a show called the mansion poker dome where we had yep. speed poker. Uh, I don't know if you remember that, but uh, there was an episode where a guy from Denmark kept swearing and I kept having to give him penalties for swearing because he was doing it on the show over and over again. And basically with a speed poker show, he got timed out and uh, <laughs> he got timed out over and over again. And because it was speed, the other players had the opportunity, didn't really have the opportunity to, to slow to get him back into the table. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was one of the real uh, uh, amazing episodes that I remember uh, back in the day, but uh, throughout the world poker tour, there's just been so many different, uh, you know, being in China for the first time to to run these events where they had uh, just really didn't know what was going on. We were down in, in the island of Sanya, uh, right. uh, China, and uh, just, you know, being over there was so interesting that not having the language barrier and, and you know, some, some of the players were um, first time on playing poker. Uh, it was... Yeah, it was a, a quite an amazing experience. Uh, I think that the fact that we are doing events in different countries with different languages and and different rules and different things uh, has really taken on a new life for us on the World Poker Tour. We're in Japan where you can't gamble for money, so right. you have to get prizes, and we're doing things over there as well. Uh, it's um, I think basically the experiences more than the funny stories uh, is what I've enjoyed most about my career. But, you know, there's obviously been some funny stories as well. That's uh, very, you know, that's very all cool. the way back to that season one with Lucky Chances where right. Phil, uh, Antonio had uh, Phil Helmuth so pissed off by doing the wave and doing all this stuff. And, uh, <laughs> you know, watching those type of things happen, uh, you know, they stick with you. Very cool. Well, it's not, this is not a question I'd planned, but I'm just genuinely curious, you know, you did talk about uh, Sanya, that's what it's called in, in China? Yes, yes. Sanya and, and, and in Japan. Those are places that, for the most part, folks from the Western countries, from Europe, from North America, don't really get to. And right. obviously, the, what you see on those World Poker Tour episodes and broadcasts is and looks a little bit different. The game is the same. The players are certainly different. What can you sort of tell us, you know, it's, it's always fun to learn about different cultures and perhaps different styles of play. Is there anything you noticed from the player side of the poker scene in Japan, in China, that is certainly radically or in some way different than what a lot of us know from Europe and uh, North America as far as the way poker is played? Well, everybody's on time. Nobody's late for the tournament. Okay, there's no, there's that's, no that's a thing. So you have to be registered before the tournament starts. Mm. And so you're over there and you're, uh, you walk into a room that's full of people. And, and, you know, in the United States with this late registration, the way it is, it's very tough to even start tournaments because there's three or four or five people at a table. And, mm. you know, some people have complained about it. But just 
the the passion and the excitement that you see there is mm. some of the stuff that we saw in the early 2000s here in the United States. Now it's you know a lot more business it seems like in the United States, whereas there's still a lot of passion in Brazil. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when we did an event for the World Poker Tour in Brazil, there was people you know singing and chanting when everybody right. won a hand. Vamos. <laughs> you know, it was it was awesome. You see some of that uh, when they come here and they have those final tables uh, in the Thunderdome, but mm -hmm. uh, to see it live and nobody was offended by it you know right uh, whereas if it was here people would be like could you quiet them down and stuff uh -huh. like that it's uh -huh. um i really enjoy the passion side of it and i think mm. that you see that and you're seeing some of that in australia and some of our events too uh just the fact that everybody is excited because it's new to them so uh that's why we're really trying to keep the world poker tour global and uh, that's a lot of what i want to do uh, in the future and actually that's my question for you Oh, uh, I got it for you right now. I said, you, you live in Israel. Uh, how do we make poker more of a, uh, a global game, in your opinion? Since it seems like 90% of all media is about the United States, doesn't it? Okay. Oh, well, I'm not sure the connection to Israel there, or just the fact that I'm not living in America. No, the fact that you, don't, that you live, don't live in America. How do we so, make it a more global game? Honestly, yeah. it's just, you know, be, be as inclusive as possible. I think try to find podcast guests from different parts of the world and, right. and ask questions. Like you say, you talk about these experience, like it's, to me, it's naturally interesting. And the more you share these sorts of experiences about what happens in China and Japan, maybe someone says to themselves next time, you know, yeah, I'd, I'd love to be at a tournament where everyone arrives on time. That's, that's pretty cool. <laughs> and, yeah, and cool. quite frankly, I, but honestly, beyond necessarily the cultural barrier, there is a, a language uh, issue. And I think, you know, the, the more folks in media or who have platforms or influencers or players, whatever it is, who do travel to those non-Europe, non-North America locations, the more they can demonstrate and illustrate for all of us what it is that's going on there and just sort of like bring that to as many audiences as possible. That'll just encourage, hopefully, more people to visit those destinations in person and and quite frankly, as well, you know, it's something I'm always advocating for is when you visit any destination, don't just go to the poker room, go around, see those places. And then when you interact with local people there and they say, what are you doing here? You're here for a poker tournament. Oh, what's that? And then the locals get interested in what's going on three blocks away at the casino. So right. uh, a little bit of a, of a complex answer, but I think just, you know, continue to do what we're doing, but as with, with sort of not just... Not, not just repeating what we've done, but being open to seeing new things, saying new things and, and giving more people those sorts of, of, of platforms. And for like you as well, like trying to learn, you know, it's a little difficult for adults to learn those languages, but if you can get in touch with someone who is bilingual from those places and they'll introduce you, you know, if someone comes here to Israel, I'll say here, here's the local you know, underground or home game poker scene. Right. And I'll introduce you to a bunch of Hebrew speakers. And all of a sudden you're like, oh, okay, that's, that's a pretty cool way the Israelis play pay poker. So yeah. yeah, it's, it's interesting that I never had no idea there was a Israeli poker scene at all oh, until yeah. I started hearing you talk about it. So yeah. it's, it's crazy to think about. What I would say here more than the scene is there's something very cool. And I'll just, you know, share this with them, um, with our listeners and people who are watching, we have something called the Israel Poker Academy. It's literally okay. like a, a university. They call it first, second, and third degrees that you go and you study it like a subject, you take tests, and then wow. there's, you do your lessons. And then there's the practical aspect. As soon as you have the lessons, there's a room where you go in tables and your instructor is the dealer. You'll play one hand and then you'll analyze why did you, like you stop after wow. one hand and then you analyze the way every, why did, why did you do that? Why did you raise? Why did you fold? And everyone at the table is learning literally the specific lesson that you just practiced. In theory, you're putting it into practice at the felt. That is something that has, when I first heard about it here, I was like, my God, that's cool. I don't think that exists anywhere. Uh, maybe it does for all I don't know. Maybe it's doing the same thing in Brazil, but talking about it on these sorts of platforms exposes people to, wow, poker really, really is 
truly a, a global game. And when you see, you know, a bunch of Israelis winning bracelets and they say, oh, I learned at the Israel Academy, <laughs> Israel Poker Academy, <laughs> you know what we're talking about. So that's, that's a amazing. great question, Matt. Maybe, oh yeah. man, you're going to take, uh, take my job as the host. <laughs> no, um, no way. I don't want it. You got it. <laughs> thank you. Um, I do have um, not necessarily a, a controversial question for you, but just sort of curious to hear your thoughts. You came up with this idea of re-entry tournaments at the Commerce Casino in 2009. And basically for all intents and purposes that has sort of replaced the rebuy tournaments. So a lot of folks, um, you know, even perhaps very avid uh, and experienced uh, players, fans, may not necessarily know the difference. They think the terms are a little interchangeable, rebuy versus re-entry. So first of all, if you could just differentiate, what are the, the specific differences between that? And just sort of let us know, how do you feel about re-entry tournaments now, 11, 12 years later, as far as their impact on recreational players? So re-entry versus rebuy. Rebuy is basically you sit in the same seat and you repurchase another stack uh, of chips or add on to what the chips that you have in front of you, uh, and you don't have to pay another entry fee. Mm -hmm. So that's for one. So re-entry, when I started it in 2009, basically it was, the idea was to have a small buy-in tournament, which was a $335 turn dollar tournament with a million guarantee. And at the time, nobody had ever heard of such a thing, right? You're like, how are you going to have $335 buy-in with a million guarantee. It won't fit. You can't have that many people in one room. Mm -hmm. So the idea of re-entry was born that if you busted out the first day, you could re-enter into the next day. Right. And it was all the same tournament. So uh, that morphed into re-entering into the same tournament the same day. And so casino owners see this and they think, okay, well, we got an opportunity to collect another entry fee. So, rebuy, so rebuys are done. Those, we're not doing those anymore. We're going to do re-entry. So people have to go back up to the, the front and, and buy in again. So I really think it's been detrimental to the game. Uh, well, that, one other thing, they also, they sit in a different seat. With it's different in a different opponents. seat. Right. Yeah. Right. So in some people, some places you can ask for a different seat. Some oh, okay. places it's random where you can go to the same seat if it randomly comes up that way. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, and I know that some places say, oh, I was just in that seat. I don't want to sit there again. So they get to go to a different seat. Okay. Uh, so there's some technical things that are uh, problematic in my opinion, but you know, okay. that's, for another, that's for another time. But also I think that the, um, the fact that multiple re-entry has kind of gotten out of hand obviously mm -hmm. there's people that have a long series where they have a big re-entry event opening up the series i think it hurts numbers for the rest of the series but then there are those that say i've traveled a long distance if i bust out i don't want to go straight back to the hotel uh, in my opinion there's other ways to do things like that maybe limited to single re-entry mm -hmm. but also um you know i think that we need to recognize that the fact that reentry has hurt cash games, right? Oh, okay. In the old days, you busted out of the tournament, you went to the cash game. You went and played a satellite. You went and had dinner. You went and waited for the next tournament. You did a lot of different things that might have ge uh, generated money for the casino or for the property that you were at. Now, instead of doing that, they just go right back and re-enter again. So people have become more tournament only players. So I do really think that re-entry has hurt cash games. And I think that that's the biggest negative impact of what we started in 2009 has cool. been, it's really hurt cash games, it's hurt satellites. Satellites are basically non-existent except for one time a year, which uh, single table satellites used to be a big, big thing uh, in commerce and other places. Uh, and now they just don't exist anymore. So that's been the biggest negative impact of it, I think. Uh, you know, on the positive side, we're able to have these, you know, big, big guarantees on sure. these events. And, you know, the properties aren't as worried about missing those. So right. uh, there's been a, a new wave of things where people call it a fake guarantee versus a real guarantee, where you put up a guarantee that you know you're going to hit versus one that has some risk. So uh, mm -hmm. that's kind of the new wave of, of player think uh, mm -hmm. on this topic. But uh you know, we'll see how it goes. I don't think we're ever going to get away from reentry from from where it is now, but uh, I would love to see it scaled back a bit. I'd love okay. to see some freeze out tournaments mixed into every series with you know some reentry, single reentry, multiple reentry, no reentry. Sure. 
Well, like we said before, you know, poker is ever changing, even on the industry side. So who knows what will come over the next months, years. Um, but we want to touch upon, like I said, you know, every so often you experiment. One of the tournaments you did, I guess it was four years ago for the first time, was the social uh, experiment. Uh, you know, put away your phones, put away all your devices, just straight up sit and play poker. Um, how often do you sort of like that do you sort of like have, I don't know, a one hour a week? I'm going to go ahead and brainstorm what's my next uh, <laughs> yeah. tournament idea. Like, well, where did that sort of come from? And, and do you ever sort of really like say, okay, you know, it's time for something new and, and, and genuinely have a, a proper brainstorming session and, and, and decide to try something? Yeah, I mean, that's basically what I've loved doing my whole career. You know, we did Ironman back in the day, which was a tournament with no breaks mm. and just played to a winner. Uh, take a break whenever you want. You don't have to. You don't have to do it. You did. We did the all in our folds. We did. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, uh, the the social experiment. Uh, different. A lot of different things. You know, the bounty tournaments. The way they're 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 changing now. So there's a lot of different things that we've done and we do uh, to try and keep it fresh and keep it fun. And the social experiment was a great one because there were some players who were absolutely zero chance of ever playing in a tournament like that. And some would said, you know what? It's a big guarantee. Uh, we're going to try it. And they liked it. They liked the fact that they didn't have their phone in, in front of them and mm -hmm. they could focus a little more on the poker and they could talk a little bit more, a little more social, no headphones, no hoodies were right. allowed, no sunglasses. So it was more interesting to have uh, that type of, of game and where people uh, like were social. It just was right. awesome. <laughs> I loved it. I loved it. Well, very cool. I think it met with some pretty positive uh, feedback back in the day. And uh, yeah, sure. It's a cool thing that other venues can now try. Like you said, you know, you introduce one thing and people like it, it will catch on uh, and, and spread in that way. Um, I said we talk about the TDA. I think it's time. Uh, you mentioned uh, our, our mutual friend, Linda Johnson and Jan Fisher, of course, uh, and Dave Lamb. You four were the co-founders forming the TDA back in 2001. It's been 20 years, Matt. You guys think you would have gotten all the rules standardized by now. <laughs> I mean, in, all, in all seriousness, though, I mean, after all the work you've done over a couple of decades, what else genuinely still remains or, or comes up as issues that the TDA needs to tackle? Well, the one with the uh, time clocks is definitely one that comes up. Um, in the last one, we had big blind ante, so there was a lot of different discussion on that. Um, but there's going to be things from time to time that come up, and 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 in rulings, and you know there was a lot of changes to stud uh, tournaments, and you know those have been met with uh, you know some some op opposition from people that have played stud forever. Uh, <laughs> but there's always something. There's always something that comes up. There's always something new. There's always a new ruling that we have or a new procedure that we want to get instituted. But I really think that one in the long run is always going to be the stalling and how we make this better. Because it really does turn off a lot of poker players when somebody's so slow at the table. We talk about uh, the fact that, you know, the game isn't as social anymore. And, you know, people do have their hoodies and they aren't talking and they're staring at players and they're taking their time and they have timing tells and all of these things. So the game has changed, but uh, in the end, the game was supposed to be fun. Right. Uh, so uh, I always make an effort and, you know, it's been my mantra the last few years to make poker fun again. Uh, I think what you do and some of the things that you guys do and come out when you come out here and play these events, we want to make it fun. One of your last guests, Dylan Lindy talked about uh, having fun at the table, right? People talk to him and he's very social yet. He's a killer at the table too. So uh, it's one of those things that I think is important. Uh, but I also think it's uh, something that we need to bring back is the fun in the game. I like a great answer. And of course, shout out to episode 49, Dylan Lindy. I think Matt's going to run the table. You will mention all, all 51 episodes. I'm going to try. We'll try. We're going to try. Um, you, know, you have these, you know, these meetings and these ballrooms with, you know, dozens upon dozens of tournament directors. What are some of the more interesting or strange items that have come up for discussion and debate during your TDA? Oh, boy, we've had some good ones. We've had some doozies, you know, with the uh, the first card off the deck versus the last card off the deck. And then Daniel Negreanu comes in and he, you know, basically blasts one of the other TDs for ever coming up with this dumbest rule in the history of poker. And next thing you know, we had 200 people in the room. And not only are there 
uh, tournament directors, but they're also card room managers sure. and players. And a lot of them liked it. A lot of them still like it. A lot of them still want to use that. But the fact that Daniel Negreanu said, you know, it's the dumbest rule ever. He got a few heads to turn and he got some of the public vote to go along with him. He has know. a big voice. He has a big TV. voice. Yeah. And I love Daniel. And, uh, you know, he's been, you know, a big part of the industry. So, you know, you got to respect what he says, but at the yep. same time, I don't think the way he handled it was great. Uh, a lot of other people were turned off by it as well. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, there's always going to be those things, but the TDA, uh, the fact that standardization is what it's all about. We yeah. would, whether I like the rule or don't like the rule, if everybody else agrees that it's better for the industry, better for the players, we're going to do it. And so that's a lot of what we did. And that was a lot of the idea that I had when I went to the World Series in 2001 and said, we want to try and standardize the rules, what was met with so much opposition. But luckily, Linda Johnson gave us that opportunity to tag it on to a thing that we had back in the day called the World Poker Industry Conference. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the TDA was born. Cool. Very cool. Well, you talk about um, whether you want it or maybe some other people don't. What is something that you did kind of want uh, and proposed over the years that was not necessarily adopted by the TDA? Well, back in the Bay Area, we used to use a uh, forward moving button. That was one of the first things that we had. A uh, forward moving button. Can you explain yeah, that? So there's no dead blind. So that they, oh. the button would always move forward. Oh, wow. Okay. So we would, yeah, we would have a dead blind on the on the button, and so I okay. it was something I had always known and, and I'd always done. So when I brought it up, they were basically saying, "You can't do this. Right. <laughs> this isn't this isn't the way we do it." So I had to to change my whole thought. You know. Okay. Way, so, you know that that was the early days of it. But uh, you know, for the most part, it's really one of those things where we we put up something, we put up a rule there's a, like I said, almost 200 people in the room. If we get 90% or 85% of the people in the room to agree that this is best, we'll take a vote. And then we'll try and get the other 10%, 15% to sway mm -hmm. over just for the betterment of the game. And, uh, it always doesn't always work. It doesn't always go that way. It doesn't always happen. But uh, for the most part, we've had pretty much agreement. And the fact that we have the WSOP on board and the WPT on board, and it was the EPT, yeah. uh, really makes it easier for us. Because as a player, you deserve the right to go to, from tournament to tournament and have the same rules. And, sure. Uh, it's one of the things I stress all the time with the players is that these guys are playing for millions of dollars, and some of them don't even know the rules. Right. So. If that was my profession, I know that I would know the rules of the game. I play golf a lot. I would know that that uh, I know all the golf rules or try to know all the golf rules because if I'm going to be playing, you know, I want to play by the rules. Right. And so I always stress to those people that you should you should know the TDA rules. If There's certainly something to that. Not exactly the same, but in a similar way. You know, when you go to McDonald's, no matter where you are in the world, those <laughs> fries are going to taste the same. And That's because right. they play by the same playbook. So you, you uh -huh. just have that knowledge. So I agree with you that as a player, it, it would be nice to know that wherever you're playing, the rules are the same. Um, look, this is according to the website, Matt. I mean, I don't know if many people know this. Apparently, and correct me if I'm wrong, anyone can just pay the $10, take the TDA test and get certified as a tournament director if they pass. So first of all, is that correct? That is correct. So yeah. how hard is this test? I mean, I know, I know a lot about poker. There's <laughs> 300,000 members of the cards chat forums. We could just go pay the tenor and, and just jump in there and get certified. Or I mean, maybe- you Yeah, you get certified, but question. that's the, the thing is, is that we want everybody to know the rules. Okay. We want everybody to know the TDA rules. So the fact that you're certified doesn't get you, you know, anything uh, specific. The fact that you know the rules and are, you know, a part of the TDA, you know, community as well. Like you have card chat. We, we have the same thing. We have a forum there as well. Mm -hmm. So I'm happy to answer questions for anybody at any time on those things. And over the years through Twitter and email and, and all of the different ways I've, I've been able to answer these questions for people. But I think that, you know, the more people that know the rules, it's going to be better for all of us. Hmm. I like that. Good, good answer. And, and I have to say it has crossed my mind at least once or twice over the years in the home game well, on the rare occasion where there is some sort of a rule where I'm not 100% sure of. I'm like, maybe I should ask Matt. And I'm sure that has happened to you oh. thousands of times over the years. Thousands and thousands of times. Yes. yes. <laughs>
Okay. Yes. As Kevin Mathers is the guy that answers the questions on tournament info, I'm the guy that answers the ones on the rules. Indeed. And of course, Kevin Mathers, shout out to episode number 45 here on the Cars Chat Podcast. Matt, you're doing fantastic. This is not a prop bet. I promise you folks. Um, uh, where is it? Oh, here we go. Matt, I know you have um, very strong feelings about the Poker Hall of Fame. At the end of the day, a rose by any other name smells just as sweet. And in my opinion, at least, your work as a builder in poker speaks for itself, regardless of when, because it's only a matter of when, you do finally get voted in. Nonetheless, please say your piece and also please let us know what, if anything, we regular poker folks can do to get the induction process revised. Um, you know, look, I think it's, it's a great honor to be nominated. I've been nominated uh, six times, five times now, uh, six times, five, five years in a row. And then they took it on, off uh, the players nominating one year uh, or the people nominating. Um, and so that year I wasn't nominated, uh, strangely enough. And so uh, it's, <laughs> it's, I think it's a great honor just to be nominated. Um, the fact that they've cut it back to one person a year, I'm not sure why that is. Uh, the The fact that the living members um, do the voting, there's definitely some clicks there that uh, are going to, to make that happen. I know for a fact that uh, they contact each other and say, let's all vote for this person this year. So obviously that's not great, um, but you know, it is what it is. If, if I've, I've, I've won four GPI awards, Eric Danis, uh, well, you know, they have a great awards program yeah. that they do. So I've won four of those. So that's a great honor. Uh, I've won the uh, honor with the World Poker Tour, uh, WPT Honors. That was a, a great night, special night. My, me yeah. and my family were there for that. So, you know, those type of things come uh, as they come. I, I can't really change the fact that uh, that they only allow one person in and I got voted second last year. So, you know. Who knows? With all the people that are turning 40 now, uh, it, that may change. But you know, one of the things that I think shouldn't change is the fact that they have a list of things that are on there that say the criteria. You know, who, who gets in. Right. And one of them is stands the test of time, which I mm. think that I've done. So yeah. uh, not everybody that's being nominated, I, in my opinion, has stood the test of time. How about that? That's, that's certainly fair. And again, I got to say, you say studying, standing the test of time, involved for 30 years in the industry how the heck do you still look like you're 35 years old man <laughs> i don't know i think it's uh must be the uh my wife must be the, <laughs> keeps me young it's genuinely incredible like really like even when i see you in person also the same like my god how has he been involved in poker that long <laughs> it's, it's just wow. incredible uh and of course shout out to eric denis that would be episode number denis, 44 um you don't just issue rulings, Matt. You also play the game. Uh, according to the Hendon mob, apropos Eric Denis, uh, you have over $126,000 in live tournament caches with a lot of them coming in mixed games. Yay, we like yes. that stuff. Uh, including a WSOP stud eight or better final table uh, in 2009. How often do you get to play in tournaments and in cash games? And what's your favorite variant of poker to play? I love mixed games. You know, I love uh, limit hold'em. I, I don't love limit hold'em. I love limit games. I love <laughs> horse variants. I love triple draw. I love uh, Omaha eight or better. And probably my favorite is stud eight or better. So those okay. are the games that I really love to play. Um, another question for you, Robbie. Can you be the best poker player in the world if you don't play mixed games? Can you? Can you Grasping. be the best poker player in the world? I think it's important to be extremely well-rounded and you could certainly be the best Holden player, but we've seen too many times that, you know, when they want to go ahead and experiment and they'll play in the do seven triple draw and they're like, how do you play this game? Poker yeah. encompasses all the variants. That's my, uh, that's my opinion. You can put my two cents in there. So you got to know at least the good variety of games and have success at it to be considered in my personal opinion. Yeah. I mean, so, so you can't be the best poker player in the world if you don't play mixed games. Yep. That's Robbie Straczynski's vote. Hot take, hot take. Hot take. <laughs> That's as hot as you'll get from me. <laughs> 
<laughs> that's so, as so, hot as we'll get from you. That's it. That's oh, it. Come on. Um, your, wait, good so when you Angle, your good friend Ari Angle would not agree with you. That's true. And you referenced episode number 36. Folks, this is just a pleasure. Unbelievable. <laughs> I, remember, I remember Ari Angle's 36. Um, so when do you play stud eight or better? When do you have time to play catch games uh, and, and tournaments? And when do you fit that in? Well, generally it was during, uh, you know, during COVID, we were playing, we had an online game that we played, uh, you know, on one of these apps. And then, um, you know, during the World Series, it basically was the only time that I was off or during the summer. So mm. I would go around and play events at the WSOP and I've got a pretty good percentage cash caching. So, you know, it's, it's one of those things that, you know, it's fun to be in the venue with all the people that I see throughout yeah. the year and playing with them. So it's one of those things that I think is important, but uh, definitely, um, that's the time that I get to play the most. There are some games that are going around those small tournaments that are happening here in town. Uh, I just went to uh, barge uh, last week. Oh, nice. Very yeah. Cool. And so I was over there at that event and uh, yeah, saw a lot of people that I haven't seen in a long time. Uh -huh. uh, so yes, well, very definitely, cool. definitely a cool event. And uh, they play all the mixed games. That's all they play. Yeah. <laughs> Always wanted to attend one of those. Hopefully, hopefully someday. Uh, one of the questions is you obviously know from listening to every episode, we always ask who is the friendliest player you've competed against at the felt? The friendliest player that I've competed against at the felt. Um, hmm. <laughs> I should know the answer to this, right? I <laughs> you this know, if there was one question you could prepare for, you would know. <laughs> Well, I'm just going to go with Linda Johnson. How about that? Okay. It's an easy one. You know, I always say that her and Mike Sexton were the two uh, biggest influences in my career because, uh, you know, they're the greatest ambassadors that the game has ever seen. So, uh, yeah, those two people are, I think, probably the friendliest, funnest to play with because they've always got stories. And, you know, they both do what I think is very important is protecting the dealers and other mm. players at the table. So sure. uh, that's super important to me. And so whenever I play with people like that, it's noticed and it's recognized. Good so stuff. I appreciate that. Yep. Good stuff. I like it. Uh, let's talk trophies, Matt. Uh, you recently won a golf trophy uh, designed like a bear that you <laughs> said it reminded you of the California State Poker Championship trophy. That's a cool one. Obviously, you know all about the Remingtons at the LAPC. Those are classics. You've got the title belts uh, over at Playground, uh, Hard Rock's giving out guitar trophies. So in your opinion, what is the coolest poker trophy? Oh, this is an easy one. Okay. Simple. The Mike Sexton Champions Cup. Okay. Yes, I knew you would say that. <laughs> so uh, we're going to ask you for we're going to ask you who's the silver medalist then. <laughs> uh, silver medalist. You know, it's tough to go against the Remington. It's just a classic, right? There's even one in the uh, the Oval Office. There's a Remington. Same thing. Oh, okay. In the Oval Office. Look at pictures of the Oval Office. Huh. It's in there. The cool. Remington is there. It was featured in the show Billions as well. Uh -huh. uh, so I would say probably the Remington. Uh, okay. you know, obviously, we have some cool trophies down in uh, Florida as well, you know, with the guitars and stuff. And yeah. I like that as well. But, you know, it's one of those things uh, uh, that I think is a classic. Okay. The Remington. I like it. We will accept that answer. Um, Matt, I'm obliged by the Motion Picture Association of America to give you precisely <laughs> 36 seconds to plug the movie Lucky <laughs> You. Uh, that's one second per dollar of royalties you've received <laughs> over the last six months. Your time begins now. You're on the clock. <laughs> Look, Lucky You, it's a, it's a cult classic. It's going to make a big comeback. It is a masterpiece. You have to watch it again to understand. Uh, it's filled with comedy. It's filled with uh, great poker play and outstanding actors, Robert Duvall, uh, Drew Barrymore, Eric Bana, Robert Downey Jr., uh, Gene Smart, Matt Savage. Uh, just the list goes on and on. You've got 10 seconds. People. Uh, uh, so definitely go out and check it out. Amazon Prime, it's on sale today. Don't just rent it, buy it. All Lucky right. You. <laughs> Moving on, I took special delight in asking that question. <laughs> um, you once had aspirations of becoming a pro bowler. So I'm not gonna ask you directly about that. This is a poker show, it's not a bowling show, but I am going to ask you if you've ever bowled against the guest on our episode number 26, Mr. Nor Norman Chad, a bowling aficionado. I have, I actually did a show called Inside Poker and check it out, you can find it on online uh, with Norman Chad. So just a couple frames. He looks like Fred Flintstone when he bowls. He's <laughs> not, not a good bowler. Uh, yeah, he wasn't, he's not a good bowler. 
But uh, I like to keep that quiet, you know, because you don't want to never know when you, uh, a match is going to come up uh, after some poker tournament and stuff like that. Uh -huh. but I haven't bowled. I haven't bowled much in years. So, uh, yeah, the the the, the late great uh, the late great uh, Lane Flack was a great bowler as well. Mm. So, um, OK, rest in peace, my friend Lane. But yeah, yeah. it was. Uh, yeah, it was a, a different time in my life for sure. Uh, I actually got out of it because there wasn't didn't seem like there was any money in it. So that's okay. how I ended up getting in the poker industry. Yep. Interesting. Okay. Uh, I remember Inside Poker, you can find that on Poker Go. If you guys are subscribed, uh, you can look for it there. Great show. Uh, you and uh, Sarah Herring uh, had some some really yeah. great uh, times on that show. I enjoyed yes, that. Exactly. I mean, it's it's one of those things that like that a lot of these guys that are playing, uh, you know, video games and things like chess with Jen Shahadi and stuff, they're definitely going to have, uh, there's no, like not a lot of money to be made in it. So that's how they kind of find their way to poker. All right, cool. I, I'm pretty sure at this point you literally have the list of episodes in front of you because you name dropped Jen Shahadi and she was episode number five. Am I, am you oh, have she a, was on a show. She was on a show. I didn't even know she was uh -huh. on Aha! You missed one. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know she was on this show. No. All right. So, uh, yes, it is episode number five. That's Jen Shahadi. Um, last question, sort of a two-parter before we move on to the questions from our loyal listeners. Uh, as a lover of bowler and big sports, um, is the Pete Weber saying, who do you think I am? Who, sorry, who do you think you are? I am. So, so you guys just look that up on YouTube. Who do you think you are? I am. Um, <laughs> is that the greatest sports soundbite ever? <laughs> and who is the Pete Weber of poker? Well, that's a good one. Uh, the Pete Weber of poker would be, uh, whew, that's a good question. <laughs> um, it's gotta be somebody that's, uh, that's brash and loud. Uh, and he does the crotch chop too. So let's see. <laughs> <That's true. laughs> um, okay. I would say it's probably, I don't know, Frank Sapuchin. How about that? Okay. I don't know if you know who that is, but he's heard loud and brash. Yes. Okay. He's loud and brash, that's for sure. Okay. WPT well, champion, Frank Sapuchin. There you go. Well, we'll go with that. Folks, uh, and Matt, of course, you know this is now the segment of the show that we turn to everyone in the card chat community to see what questions you guys wanted to ask our guests. We have a dedicated thread on the cards chat forums for this. So as we announce who our future guests will be, please be sure to send in your questions. The first question today comes from Bella Donna 5 Thank you very much, Bella Donna, for sending in this one from Matt. Uh, Matt, what was one of the toughest decisions or rulings you had to make as a tournament director? I, I always go back to the one at the World Series with Russell Rosenblum, where he was in a pot with uh, Julian Gardner. And uh, Julian Gardner uh, wrestled, made a raise, small raise. And Julian Gardner says, I'm all in. And Russell leapt from the table and ran around the room and said, and I walked over to him and I said, what are you doing? He, said, he says, I fold, I fold. And as I'm going to the table for him to, fo to fold his cards, he realized that it was a, just another small amount uh, over the, his bet, what he had done. And he would have definitely had called with his two jacks and Julian Gardner won the pot with two fives. And Julian Gardner ended up making $1.1 million in that tournament. And luckily for Russell Rosen, we kind of recovered and he made the final table, finished fifth himself in 2002. That is, certainly sounds like a tough ruling. Um, Crystals, one of your buddies who you referenced when you told me about the show, Crystals has a lot of questions for you, Matt. Uh, what okay. do you believe is your biggest accomplishment to date in poker? Definitely the TDA. I mean, if it wasn't for the, you know, the vision of that coming up, I probably would not, I definitely wouldn't be in my career where I am today. I mean, it was out of that I got invited to, you know, Worked the World Series of Poker and mm. you know you know the early days of the the WPT and things like that. Uh, definitely, that was my my biggest accomplishment for sure. Okay, good. Next question from Crystals: When the San Jose Sharks play the Las Vegas Golden Knights, who do you cheer for? <laughs> <laughs> my wife's not around here. <laughs> Folks, if you're not watching, Matt just looked, <laughs> looked over his shoulder. Just saying. I, uh, <laughs> Uh, the San Jose Sharks. Okay. I've just been a fan since season one, so I got I to gotta stick with them. That's totally fair. And uh, Marianne, if you're listening, it's okay. <laughs> we still love Matt. Uh, next question. Oh. <laughs> next question from <laughs> Crystals. Um, where is your ultimate golf vacation destination? Whew, that's a tough one, but probably uh, Bandon Dunes. 
just because I've been there a couple times already, and it's beautiful. It's up in the coast, on the coast of Oregon. Mm -hmm. uh, so definitely there. Even though I've played Pebble Beach a few times, I think the Band and Dunes is a great trip because it's a, just a great resort. And if you haven't been there and you're a golfer, uh, you got to get there someday. Okay, interesting. Cool. Um, you had already told us that you don't really bowl that much anymore, but the question from Crystals is, what is your average bowling score today? So you can answer that question however you'd like. Wow. I'd probably average somewhere uh, around the 180s, 190s. When I quit bowling, That's not I bad. was around 210. That's not bad. Wow. And it was back in the day when the, all the equipment was, you know, things change in the game where the equipment isn't the same as it was today. So people average much higher today, uh -huh. uh, but it, it, it's, it's easier to average higher today. Uh huh. So the balls got more spherical and the lanes got more oily. Got it. Okay. okay. <laughs> Something like that. Something like that. Okay. Last question <laughs> from Crystals. What has been the scariest night you have been through in a poker room? Ugh. The scariest night I've been through. Um, the scariest night was probably in uh, England. Okay. When we were going to miss the guarantee by what happened ended up being six hundred and forty thousand dollars. Who? So that's a scary one. But yeah, I definitely had some adventures over the years. That's for sure. Macau. We've had some fun nights and scary nights after uh, after hours type mm -hmm. things. But in the poker room, it has to be uh, in London. I, this is not a question from Shells, but I really kind of want. Oh, no, this is from, from Crystals. I kind of hoping you'll elaborate a little because that sounds okay. very interesting. <laughs> uh, what do you mean? Which part of it? <laughs> well, uh, as far as the scare, I mean, you know, you're, you're promoting this tournament. And, yeah, uh, we're promoting it. It was for the it was for a company that's defunct now and probably okay. went out of business right after that called the World Sports Exchange. Mm. And uh, they had a tournament that uh, we were we had. I think it was a gosh, what was it? Yeah, it was a two million guarantee. Mm. And miss, we missed the guarantee by six hundred and forty thousand. Wow. And it was in London in a place with like it was an amazing event. Uh, mm -hmm. It just was not promoted as well as we'd hoped, Goodness. and they didn't they didn't bring in all the players that they thought they were going to. It's when it was a betting site that was trying to move over to poker, and okay. uh, you know they were really counting on us to to try and help them make this happen. Mm -hmm. And so they put up all this money. It doesn't matter. It was a, it was a sports betting site. You mm -hmm. know what? It's okay if they lose a little bit of money. Right. Okay. Interesting. Well, that's a fascinating story. I mean, you don't you don't hear about that too much. That a guarantee no. is being missed by that much. Um, no, you don't. Okay, Shells, the last uh, person who submitted some questions. Thank you guys all for doing so. Uh, we got a few, a good handful from Shells. What do you enjoy most about your work, Matt? Ah, uh, the players, meeting people and uh, traveling the world. And uh, luckily, you know, my deal with the World Poker Tour is that my wife gets to go with me. So mm -hmm. the fact that Marianne right. is it's in the contract, right? Yeah, it's in the contract. Yeah. That is right. And uh, yeah, not many people have a contract like that, but uh, I wasn't going to be able to do it without her. So mm -hmm. it's uh, it's one of those things that, you know, we are fortunate enough to be able to do these things. And we usually try and tack a day on before or after the tournament to try and, uh, you know, see the sites of where we're at. But, you know, over the last few years, uh, you know, with before pandemic, you know, mm -hmm. we got to see some amazing, amazing places, Latin America, we went to Uruguay, we went to uh, Argentina, we went to uh, Brazil, mm -hmm. um, China, and, you know, basically all over the world with poker. And uh, that's been an excellent opportunity for us to do and be a part of. That's absolutely wonderful. Just again, that, that you just don't see that so much. And just the ability okay. to literally marry, marry your passions together. You got poker, you got your wife with you and just get yeah, to experience those Being able to work, being able to work with Lynn Gilmartin and Tony Dunst and mm. Mike Sexton and Vince Van Patten has just been, you know, really it's, it's like a family, you know, mm. Adam Plisko always calls it the WPT family yeah. and it really is, it really has become a family and uh, we're lucky to have each other, you know, to, to, to make that happen. Very cool. Uh, next question from Shells. What is the craziest thing you have witnessed at a poker tournament? <clears throat> the craziest thing I've witnessed? Um, hmm. <laughs> My tournaments? Uh, uh, that's not the question. <laughs> at a <laughs> poker tournament. So, so, well, something, something that you've been there in person to see. Oh, something that I've been there to see. Um, 
at the showdown at the Sands in 2003. Okay. Uh, first of all, it was a tournament where I went and on the third meeting, I explained to them the structure and they said, what is this? I thought it was a stud tournament. Oh, they didn't have any idea it was <laughs> that was that was the start of that tournament. Then we were oh, inside God. this tiny ballroom with windows on the top and then uh, torrential rains came and water started leaking oh, in and God. leaking into the TVs and things were falling apart. And uh, yeah. Uh, ben Affleck was there with uh, with J Lo uh, in the early days, so that was that wow. was a, a very memorable event. And then they it, oh. they blew up the stands shortly after that. Unrelated. 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 <laughs> Unrelated. <laughs> it needed to be blown up though. Okay, <laughs> that, that is fair. Uh, <laughs> next question from Shells, Matt. What is your biggest fear? My biggest fear. Oof. Mm. Yeah, my biggest fear is, uh, I don't know, my biggest fear. Um, hmm, that's a good give question. you a mulligan. <laughs> my biggest fear, uh, I don't want to think about it. Uh, it was something bad happening to my family. You know, okay. I always worry about that. That's, uh, you know, family is most important. So I think that'd be my biggest fear. That's understandable. Um, yeah. Okay. Final two questions. The penultimate question uh, from Shells. How would your friends describe you? My friends would describe me as uh, loyal, um, hopefully hardworking. Uh, they, my wife hates it, but they, some, they sometimes call me a golf hustler, but that's <laughs> not true. <laughs> I definitely lose as much as I win, uh, but uh, it's... Uh, I think um, hardworking and loyal is probably the two ways they describe me best. Two beautiful qualities to have. Uh, and you don't, uh, you don't get friends to describe you like that without earning it, at least in my yeah. opinion. Uh, final question for you, Matt. If you weren't involved with poker, what would you be doing? I would probably be involved in something in the bowling industry. Um, luckily, that's not the case. Mm. Uh, but I've always said I wanted to be a bartender. So I never mm. got the chance to be a bartender. I think that'd be a fun job. But I I just never had that job and uh, always thought it'd be interesting. But instead, it's just drinks on you. Got it. Yeah, okay. it's just drinks on me. Yes. <laughs> very cool. Well, folks, thank you very much for sending in questions for Matt Savage. And again, a friendly reminder to everyone in our Cards Chat community that we'd love to see you submit your questions for our future podcast guests in the dedicated thread on the forums. Please be sure to give us a good review on iTunes and spread the word via your social media channels if you liked the show. Matt, before we let you go, anything else you'd like to tell our listeners? No, I just uh, looking forward to this year. Uh, you know, we got some great events coming up in the World Poker Tour with, uh, you know, uh, Maryland and then back to Seminole Hard Rock and back to Bellagio, which we're excited about. Nice. Uh, so just come out and check us out and uh, I'll be at all those events. And, um, you know, I just really think that uh, poker is making its way back and excited to see that happen. So, uh, you know, it's really been a tough time for a lot of people for the last couple of years. So I look forward to seeing a lot of old friends and, and people that I haven't seen in a couple of years. Beautiful. Excellent uh, positive note on which to end the show. Uh, folks, uh, thank you again very much. Matt, thank you again very much. Uh, guys, enjoyed this uh, very, very much. Uh, thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Cards Chat Podcast. I'm Robbie Straczynski. You can follow me on Twitter at Card Player Life. I wish you all a wonderful day. <laughs>